Okay, one of the rules for making these tapes is that um, I'm not supposed to say anything that dates the tapes, but I cannot resist. The day that I am broadcast, we are broadcasting this date, is the first day of National Obesity Week, and it is also National Eat a Pie Day. <laughs> eat Pie Day, National Pie Day, or Eat a Piece of Pie Day, or something like that. Only in America. What a great country. All right? So I, I'm going to eat obese pies, and I figure I'll be all right. OK, um, let's start a little with uh, our uh, English lesson. OK, what's correct? John and me went to the store, or John and I went to the store? Push, somebody push it down. John and I, right, because John and I, I went to the store. OK? I did the work with John and she, or I did the work with John and her? Her. I did the work with her. If you want the grammar, it's the object of the preposition with. But just take out the, it doesn't change. You don't say, I did the work with her. Suddenly I did the work with John and she. No, I did the work with John and her. If you think that it sounds more sophisticated to say with John and she, it only sounds sophisticated to people who are not sophisticated. Mm -hmm. People who know English groan, groan. William F. Buckley was dedicated, he had a, a guest on a talk show about the English language and he spent, he said, well, let's talk about this for one minute and it took up three quarters of the show. He's a talk show since retired. Just, uh, okay. Now the only way that that doesn't work is with between. It's a secret between you and I or a secret between you and me. Me, me, between you and me. Sitting in the sand. Na 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 na, we were holding hands. Na 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 na, vowing we'd be lovers just between you and me. Da na na na. Don't worry, there's no charge for concerts. I sing in class all the time and they're free. So don't worry. The concerts are free. All right, between you and me, it's the object of the preposition between. All right? One more and then we'll go on today. He's taller than me or taller than I? I. Than is not a pre than is a is not a preposition. He's taller than I am. Now I have to admit to you, it sounds a little strange to me. It sounds bad to me to say he's taller than me. It sounds strange to say he's taller than I. So I always put the am in. He's taller than I am. But it's I, I. Than is a conjunction. If you're gonna be a teacher, you gotta know how to speak English. Okay. All right. Let's go um, back to what we were talking about. We were talking about evidence and kinds of evidence we accept and don't accept. Okay, let's go back to the um, PowerPoint for a minute. Last time we talked about common sense. Let me just do this briefly. And we said that, <clears throat> whoops, 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 common sense. And we said, why does it keep doing that? Let's go back again. Don't look at this. Common sense. There it is. And we said that common sense, what's common sense to some people is not common sense to others. What's common sense changed? I told you the stories about the survey. And common sense is off, thank you for that picture in the corner. And common sense is often used as an ex when people don't have a good argument, they try to bully you with use your common sense. Only people with common sense could. Anyway, with common sense would believe that it's my way. Okay, come back to me for a second. Okay, and there are a lot of things that have gone on common sense. So some people, it's common sense to give kids grades that's a little worse than they really deserve, so it'll encourage them to do better. And to some people, it's common sense to give kids grades that are a little better than they deserve, because it'll encourage them to do better. Well, a scientist would say, I, I, you know, I want to see. Let's try it out and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> to some people, phonics is common sense. To some people, whole language is common sense. 
Well, common sense. So you've got to be very careful about common sense and what's not common sense. For instance, to many people, it's common sense to say, well, if a kid can't get something, let's teach it earlier and do more. Psychologists will tell you that can be a disaster, some psychologists anyway. If a kid doesn't know something, drill it more. It's common sense. You don't know, let the kid practice it a lot. Some people say it's common sense. Some people say if the kid doesn't know it, obviously doesn't. some psychologists tell you that's the worst thing you can do. Kid doesn't understand what you're talking about here. You don't understand what you're doing, do more of it, do more of it, do more of it. So you've got to be very careful about common sense. One more that we got to talk about, uh, but before we do this, come back to me. How many of you are aware of the fact that sugar makes kids hyper? Eating sugar makes kids hyperactive. How many of you are aware of that? Okay, almost everybody. Okay, it's the truth. Teachers will tell you that. Parents will tell you that, all kinds of people in education tell you that. The only people who don't believe that are scientists who have done experiments. Okay? They take kids, they give half the kids a candy with sugar or a food with sugar and half a kid, kids can, the food with no sugar. They allow the kids to go off and play and then they let people observe them who don't know which kid had which. And every single time they do that, and it's been done over and over and over again, there's no difference. Anybody shocked? As a matter of fact, there's no evidence that any food that you eat has any effect on your personality, unless the food has a drug in it, like, say, caffeine, right? I, I almost never drink coffee. When I was in college, I never drank coffee. So I'd go and take no-dose or Vivarin or some pill that was full of caffeine. I'd take three of them, and, right? Because <laughs> right? it had enough, but that's a drug, right? Mm -hmm. If you have food with drugs, or like cola, some colas have drugs, etc. That'll make a difference. I mean, caffeine, it's a drug, right? But food, as a matter of fact, there are people who are vegetarians who will claim that not eating meat gives you a more uh, sedate personality, not eating the flesh of another that makes more passive and less aggressive and less hostile and less angry. Well, Hitler was a vegetarian, so. <laughs> now, that's an anecdote. That doesn't prove anything, but there's just no thing. Right? So there, there's no evidence that that's true. So when you have common knowledge, right? when you have common knowledge, okay, let's go back here. Things that everyone knows, but that may not be so, okay? Okay, the general acceptance of an idea just isn't evidence that something is, that some, that something is true, even if everyone accepts it. There used to be a saying, I don't know if they still use it, 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. Well, 50 million Frenchmen can be wrong, okay? Just because everybody says it doesn't make it true. And often people with bad, with bad ideas, for instance, you will hear that I have grave reservations about the whole terminology attention deficit disorder. And invariably I'm told, well, people have been talking about it since 1912. So what? People talk for five or 2,000 years about the Earth being flat. So? The Earth's being flat. So? Doesn't make it, make it right, okay? And this could be, this may be the worst mistake that you can make, okay? Because it's very, very, very difficult to prove something is not true. Come back to me for a second, okay? Okay, here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna really give you the truth now. Everything that you think and feel comes from a gigantic green grasshopper. I'm gonna stand up, okay, ready? A gigantic green grasshopper. And this green grass, can you get him closer? Is that possible? Yeah, never mind. And this green grasshopper is somewhere, I'll make it easy, is somewhere in the solar system, is somewhere in the solar system, never mind, is somewhere in the solar system jumping on a, on a gigantic keyboard, almost at the speed of light, typing out everything that every person is going to think and feel. Okay? Now, I believe that that grasshopper is there until you prove to me 
that, that it's not. I even have evidence. I have evidence. What, what my evidence? How many times have you been there and you're, you're on the sink and you're looking for the toothpaste and you look and you can't see it and then all of a sudden you turn around and there it is right in front of your nose. Who's ever had that happen? Raise your hand, right? Everybody, right? That's because once in a while the grasshopper gets a little bit behind. And, it, and it's not typing what you're supposed to think or feel, and you're blanked out completely. All right? That's my evidence for the grasshopper. Now, if you want to prove to me that the grasshopper is not that, remember, it's got six legs, so it can type pretty fast, okay? If you want to prove to me that there's no grasshopper there somewhere in the solar system, what do you have to do? Well, go ahead, push it down, say it. Search the entire solar system? Yeah, search, search the whole solar system. You have to search everywhere. So you search everywhere on the Earth. You search under the ocean and in every cave and in every. It's not there. You say, well, now look on the moon. Now look here. Because I could really be rotten and say the grasshopper has a rocket ship. Then you'd have to search the, solar system, the whole solar system at the same time, if everywhere at the same time. But until you show me evidence that it's not there, I know it's there. Maybe you can't find it yet, but I know it's there. Okay? And this is beautiful because, let's go back to the PowerPoint. I'm sitting down. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Because the true believer, like me, can always say, I know I'm right. Just keep looking. It's there somewhere. Didn't find it on the moon. Go search every asteroid. Didn't find every ast on every asteroid? Go search Mercury. Then search every place on Venus. Then search the moons. Then search Mars and the moons of Mars and Jupiter. Right? You can always say that. You can always say keep looking. Now, I'm not bringing this up for no reason. Okay, I'm not bringing this up for no reason. Okay? You will hear people tell you, we know that kids who have dyslexia have something wrong with their neurological system. We're just not sure what it is. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. Right? We know that kids with ADD have something wrong with them neurologically. Well, what is it? I don't know. Keep looking, keep looking. It's there somewhere. Well, you have to ask yourself, if you don't know, if you can't find it, how do you know? Come back to me for a second. Th these kinds of things, it's almost impossible now to prove to people that sugar, how are you going to prove, once you know that sugar causes kids to be more hyper, how do you know? So how, do you, how can you unconvince people? So it's, it, I can tell people things like, and this is what they figured out, kids tend to get more hyper when they eat sugar in places where they generally eat sugar. So you go to a birthday party, have the cake, and the kids are running around. Well, they run around at birthday parties anyway. Or it's lunch break, and the kids are sitting at school, the bell ring, they're running around like crazy, stuffing the candy bars in their mouths, right? <laughs> when I was teaching, I knew one kid. It was, it was like, I said to the kid, you're wasting your time. You should go out and try out for a gymnastics team. You could eat a candy bar with two, hands. perfect coordination, two different kinds of candy bars. He said, I like to taste the better. He had it down to how many chews per candy bar, right? <laughs> he, was, he was a fifth grader. He was good. In any case, right? And the kids are hyper. Yeah, go ahead. Did you want to ask a question? No, okay. By the way, if you want to interrupt me or, or disagree with me, please do. I have to tell you, in, you know, in your high school yearbook, you have a... You have a little caption underneath. Mine was, whatever you say, I disagree. So I disagree with them. So if, and if, especially if you're taking other courses, if you want to disagree with me, disagree with me. Not everybody agrees with me, you will see. And I want to hear other opinions. Okay, so what we, what we have here, let's, let's go back to the PowerPoint now. What we have here are certain kinds of evidence that we just can't do. Just because somebody tells you something's true from his or her own experience, or even if the person's an expert, you need to have evidence. Even if the person is your boss, you may have to take it. It doesn't mean you have to believe it. Common sense, 
Uh-uh. I need evidence. Too much thing, too many things here. Let me give you another example of common sense. Come, come to me for a second. Okay. I want everyone to stop. If you're on the tape, stop now. Put all your pencils down. Close your eyes and try, try very, very hard to feel if you're moving. Sit in your chair as still as you can. Can you, does anybody feel that you're moving? Anybody feel it? You feel yourself spinning around in a circle like this? Well, scientists are telling us that we're going around like this, and that at the same time we're spinning around on our axis every 24 hours, thousands of miles an hour. If you're on the equator, you're going 25,000 miles in 24 hours. It takes us, we're going a little less. You really think like you're going thousands of miles an hour and they're going around the sun? Use your common sense. We're not moving. Look, you can look in the sky and see the sun moving through the sky. Use your common sense. You can see it. Obviously, we're not moving and the sun is moving. Use your common sense. Well, common sense may tell you one thing, but the scientists say, I don't think so. Then you have to start to wonder, well, you know. Use your common sense. The moon obviously grows and gets small. And we ever see a harvest moon, that huge moon in the sky? It's much bigger than the moon up in the air. How can that be? By the way, there's not a very good explanation for that. People try to wonder, why should, how, why should that be that sometimes the moon looks huge? A full moon use, looks huge. The harvest moon, you know what I'm talking about? It's right on the horizon. Sometimes it's small. The moon must be growing and shrinking. It must be like a balloon. That's what your common sense says, but go ahead. I saw a hand over there. You have to push down the black, black thing. Then you can say whatever you want. I saw a hand over there. Don't lie to me. <laughs> Oh, you want to say something? No? All right, so come. And finally, let's go back here, common knowledge. This may be the most dangerous one of all. Once something's accepted, you've had it. Because it's hard to unprove something. You can't prove to me the grasshopper's not there. That's why scientists say, you know what? A scientist will not say to me, the scientist may think, this guy is a screw loose. But what the scientist would say to me, talking as a scientist, would say, look, you may be right, but until you bring me evidence, good solid evidence, that the grasshopper's there, I'm not gonna, I, I, I can't accept it. And by the way, blacking out for 10 seconds, not being able to find the toothpaste that's right in front of me, you know, or, or, or driving home and not knowing how you got there, how people have been driving home and all of a sudden, oh my God, one more turn, I'm home, and I don't even remember what happened along the way. It happens to all of us, right? That's not evidence that there's a grasshopper out there typing on a typewriter, okay? So, or excuse me, on a keyboard. It shows how old I am. Okay, in addition to unacceptable evidence, we have unacceptable explanations. I'm going to talk about two, really. Um, whoops. I'm going to talk about two. Oh, for God's sake. Come back to me. Come back to me while I piddle. Okay, there are many, many. There are many, many. But um, I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one I want to talk about is, look over, let's go back to the PowerPoint, is circular explanations. These are usually often called circular definitions. But I call them circular explanation. I think it helps better. Okay. A circular explanation means saying the same thing in different words and pretending we've explained something. Okay. It's done all the time. Medicine doesn't, and it's done all the time in education. Those of you who want to be nutritionists, it's done all the time. All the time, all the time. Let me give you an example. Here's an example. That man is losing his hair because he is balding. <laughs> Ridiculous, right? Balding means losing, losing one's hair. Try another one. Want to try another one? That woman is tired all the time because she has chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, now you're not laughing. Now it's not so silly, is it? 
but chronic fatigue means tired all the time. Come back to me. Medicine does this all the time, okay? Has anybody ever gone to a doctor and told, and told you have a dermatitis? Who's ever been told you have con conjunctivitis with your eyes, right? Dermatitis means there's something wrong with your skin. I know I have a dermatitis, that's why I'm here, right? Conjunctivitis means there's something wrong with your eyes. You're tired have all the time because you're all tired all the time disease. So, but you have to be careful. See, if you want to, if you want to, you know, you got to lay it on. You know, if you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, baffle them with your BS, right? So you can't say tired all the time disease. It sounds too silly. So you say chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, that sounds, woo, now you're talking. You can't say, the trouble with your skin is you have a skin disease, so you say a dermatitis, which means an eruption on your skin. What's wrong with my skin when you have skin eruptionitis? People would laugh. But if you say dermatitis, derma means skin, right? You say, ooh, and itis means, ooh, that doesn't know the sun. Okay? Let's try another one. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Got to get my picture out of there. That person has trouble reading because she has reading troublia disease. I see smiles around here, laughter is right. Are you laughing, smiling? What about, let's tr translate reading troublia into Latin, okay? That person has trouble reading because he has dyslexia. Are you still laughing? How come you're not laughing anymore? When I took reading Troublia and gave it a fancy name, you stopped laughing. This can't me means, so you have trouble reading because you have can't read disease, everybody laughs. But if I say you have dyslexia, which means you have trouble reading, nobody's laughing. That boy does can't pay attention because he has can't pay attention disease. Everybody think that's silly? What about attention deficit disorder? Attention deficit disorder means the same thing as can't pay attention. This sounds silly, this doesn't. You have trouble paying attention because you have an attention disorder. Come back to me for a second. Imagine that you went to the doctor and you said, Doc, my foot is killing me killing me. I can't move it and it hurts and it burns. Doc says, wait a minute. Runs back in the room, gets his English Latin dictionary, foot, ped, in Latin. He says, oh, the reason your foot hurts is because you have dyspedia. That helps. Anybody know Latin? You know, my nose hurts. Oh, you have dysnosia. I can't sleep at night. Oh, you have insomnia, which means you can't sleep. I know I have insomnia. The question, that's why I'm here. The question is why? Why, when I scream, it means it's important. Why? <laughs> By the way, I have very bad news for you. I used to lose my voice. In about the second half of the semester, I had to watch about screaming. Finally, I went to a, an otolaryngologist, that's what they call it. I went to an ear, nose, and throat guy. And he said, by the way, where I come from, guy means a person, not a male or a female. Said, he said, just happened to be a he, he said, now you're straining your vocal cords. He told me why, this and that. He said, go take speech lessons. I said, sound boring. Can I take singing lessons instead? He said, yeah, that'll do the same thing. So I took singing lessons for about a year. I still can't sing, but, but I never lose my voice. So I can scream the whole semester, almost never. Okay, so. If you go to the doctor and say, and I can give you real examples, okay, the, the, okay, let's go back to this. The problem with circular explanations is they make us think we've provided a real explanation because they are always by definition correct. It's true that a person who can't read has dyslexia. 
because it means you can't read or you have trouble reading. It's true that if you go to the doctor and something's wrong with your eyes, you have conjunctivitis because conjunctivitis means something's wrong with your eyes. It's true that if you can't sleep, you have insomnia. It's true that if you can't pay attention, you have an attention deficit disorder, what that means. Except it sounds like a disorder, that's even not true. All of us have time we can't pay attention. It's true that if you're constantly tired, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, come back to me for a second. The problem is, at least, if you, if a, let's say a person, let's say it's a woman, because we'll have more reasons goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I'm tired all the time. I sleep all the time. I sleep, I get enough sleep, and I'm tired all the time. What's the doctor going to do? What would, what would the doctor's first instinct be? Check for what? If you know, what would you check for for a person who's tired all the time? Well, push it, push it down, say it. Iron. Iron, okay. Women in particular tend to suffer from iron deficiency more than men. Check iron deficiency. No, that's fine. Now what's the doctor going to check? What else would you check? See if the person's tired all the time. Anybody else? Come on, what would a doctor check? A person who's constantly tired. What do you got? Push it down. Thyroid. Thyroid. Check the thyroid. Okay? That's common. Okay, I remember. I know people who had their thyroids out or thyroid deficiency. Okay, thyroid. What else would you check for? Those are two most common ones. But check for something else. You go ahead. You got something else? Diabetes. Diabetes. People with diabetes can get fatigued. That's exactly right. Anything else? Check the blood sugar. No sweat. She's in great shape. Anything else? Well, I thought we could. We can check for a parasite, right? Something like a tapeworm or a, or a bacterial infection or something like that. Some sort of blood parasite. Right, make you tired all the time, right? You check and you check and check. There's nothing wrong that I can find with this woman. So I say, aha, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, which usually means you're tired all the time. And I don't know why, but at least the doctor would go and check, right? Would go and check. Are you getting enough sleep? Sleep apnea is another thing a person might check. There's some people who will swear to you that they they sleep eight hours a day and they do, but they're constantly getting up and certain kinds of, there's certain kinds, of, anybody know what REM sleep is? What's REM sleep? Where'd you learn that, your psych course? It's a rapid eye movement when you're, that's deep sleep. And they actually have people who, whenever they would watch them, they would obviously, be, they agreed to this. And every time they started REM, you can see the eyes moving behind the eyeballs, they'd wake the person up, right? And those people were exhausted. That, that, the deep sleep seems to be the kind of sleep. So people can think they're sleeping all night, but they, they're not. So they do sleep checks. And a, nothing's wrong with this woman. Call it chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome. Okay? But in education, we tend to jump at that first. Putting on labels rather than trying to find out what's wrong. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. The problem is with circular explanations that they don't explain anything. They boil down to saying the same thing in different words and putting the word because between the two statements. You're, you can't read because you have can't read disease, because you have dyslexia. Not that, man's, that man is losing his hair, that means he's balding, and I'm not sure why. Okay? Now, not everybody balds because of uh, you know, uh, hormones. You can bald because of alopecia. It's a disease where some clumps of hair fall out. Okay? The only reason I know about that is when I was a little kid, I had it in the back of my head. <laughs> anecdotes. You can bald for other reasons. You can bald for lack of, for poor nutrition. You can bald from radiation treatment, right? A lot of reasons you can bald. But that doesn't tell you why he's losing his hair. Just like saying that person is tired all the time because she has chronic fatigue syndrome doesn't tell you why she's tired all the time. And that kid can't read because he has dyslexia doesn't mean... And if you say, oh, there's something wrong with a person's brain, the person has dyslexia, therefore there's something wrong with his or her brain, then you have to, come back to me for a second, then you have to say, okay, show me the evidence. And if you have that evidence, you can't say, I know it's true, just keep looking, which is what we tend to hear. We'll get to more of that, okay? Let me, let me tell you one other thing. The other, and the problem is when you don't really know what's wrong, you don't know what to do. I'll give you a personal example of that. I went to my regular doctor, this was many, many years ago, 
and I come in and I had a, an eruption on my skin right over here, right? He looks, he says, oh, he said, you have a dermatitis. I said, okay, what are you going to do? I mean, I wasn't asked, I didn't say, no, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Dermatitis means eruption of my skin. I said, I can see it myself. I don't have to go to medical school to figure that out. But, you know, he used a fancy term. He said, here, take this cream. So I took the cream. Didn't work. Came back. Another cream. Didn't work. Meanwhile, I began. I don't want to get to graphic, but it was crawling all over me. It got worse and worse and worse. Right? Gave me the game. Finally, I said, sign me. Those were the days we had to get a referral. I said, sign me to a dermatologist, please. <clears throat> so I go to the dermatologist, and I had all these bags of medicine that he had given me. And there was an antifungal, and an antibacterial, and hydrocortisones, and an anti-yeast. And he takes a look, <clears throat> and he said, I can't tell, is it because it's been treated? In other words, you know, the other doctor made a mess of it, but he looks, he said, <coughs> but I think, from what I see in the new stuff, because it kept getting worse, said, uh, uh, it looks to me like an, like, uh, uh, an, uh, an allergic reaction. He said, and I think it's to a plant, but it's not typical poison ivy or poison oak. He said, but I think it's a plant, right? He said, he said, if we really have to know, I can take a microscopic scraping. I can look, I can send it off, but I'll just treat it as a general anti-allergen, right? So he gives me a prescription. He said, take this. Here's a local topical to put on it and a pill to take, an anti, you know, an antihistamine. So I said, okay. And then, meanwhile, I had to go give a talk. There was a school, I don't know if it's still there, in a, there's a, a church right across from the museum, and they, had, they used to run a school. Okay, and I was going there right after the appointment to give a talk in this school, right? In, uh, so I went there, and I go into the church, and I go in, and I, I, I picked up the prescription along the way because I was in agony, right? And then I go into the church, and I, right, and I went in, and I took off my shirt, I put the cream on, right, and I took the pill. And he said to me, by the way, he said, call me tomorrow to let me know if it's okay, if it gets anybody. He said, it should help. You should feel some relief right away. If you don't, you have to come in. We'll have to do a microscopic scraping. I go, and I'm giving this talk. Put my shirt and my jacket back on. He said, it, it would itch and burn. He said, I said, it's not itching and burning anymore. I can't believe it. Okay, by the time I get home, by the way, if you say the word antihistamine to me, I start to feel drowsy. So I'm driving home like this, holding open one arm, and I slept all that. I called him up the next day, and he said to me, I said, you made a miracle. And I told him the story. So he said to me, you took the medicine to church, right? I said, yeah. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll take half the credit for the miracle and we'll give the other half to God. <laughs> I mean, he's laughing at me. He didn't make a miracle. He just stopped giving circular explanations. Instead of saying you had a dermatitis, he came up with a cause. Your skin is erupting because it, you have an allergic reaction to some kind of a plant. It's some kind of a re allergic reaction. And he said, if I have to get more specific, I can. But I think that's an explanation. Okay? It's not circular labeling. A label is not an explanation. Now let's go back here. Okay, ne never mind, never mind. Come back off here. Come back off. I hit the wrong thing, of course, as per usual. Okay. Let's go back to PowerPoint. The other thing I want to talk about is assuming causality from correlations. Okay. Correlation does not equal causality. You know what a correlation is? Correlations are events that tend to occur together or not occur together. But this does not necessarily mean that one cause causes the other. Come to me, for instance. Okay. Come back to me. Okay. There are a lot of possibilities when two things has happened. For instance, things can be correlated positively or negatively, right? Positively means when you get one, you tend to get the other. Negatively means when you get one, you tend not to get the other. So, for instance, day and night are perfectly correlated. They have a negative, they go from minus one to positive one. When you get a zero, it means there's no correlation. They just happen at random. There's a perfect minus one correlation on day and night, right? When it's day, it's never night. When it's night, it's never day. But one doesn't cause the other. Day and night is caused by a third thing, which is the, ro the 
the Earth rotating on its axis. Okay? When two things come together, it could be that one causes the other, but you don't know which one causes which. Or it could be just random. Let me give you an example. Okay? Let me give you an example. Let's go back to PowerPoint. People who speak English are on the average wealthier than other people. Therefore, learning to speak English will make you rich. Or will increase the possibility that you'll get rich. Now, it's true that there are some poor people who speak English. But if you were to take every person in the world whose native language is English and take their average income, it would be higher than the average income of the rest of the world. Probably by a lot. Even though there'll be some very poor people in there. Oh, you want to try another one? Japanese immigrants to the USA eat more fats and have more heart disease than do Japanese who stay in Japan. Therefore, eating fats causes heart disease. Wrong, 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 wrong. It's speaking English that causes heart disease. Japanese who come to the United States speak much more English than Japanese who stay in Japan. Therefore, it's the speaking English that does it. The absence of any kind of real evidence, both of these statements are equally valid. They make equal sense. Okay, come back to me for a second. I know most of you don't believe me. It is, the, it is true that, the, in general, the, the people with the highest fat content in their diets are Americans. And we tend to have the highest rate of heart disease in the world. The Japanese have the lowest on the average, and they have the lowest rate of heart disease. But Scandinavians have a very high fat content in their diet, and they have less heart disease than the, than the British, who have lower fat content in their diet. Okay? It's pretty clear that it's speaking English that does it, right? <laughs> Once you get away from those two extreme cases, it's just not at all clear. Okay, there are some people, there are some, for instance, um, I believe it's Italians, I have the chart if anybody wants it, have a very low rate of, of uh, fat in their disease and they have a much higher, they have a higher rate of heart disease than, than uh, the French who have a higher rate of fat. So it's not so obvious, it's not so clear. Even when it seems to make common sense. Without evidence, you can't do it. I'll give you an example. I know this is a little esoteric. There's a, a connective tissue order disease called Marfan syndrome. By the way, if you happen to have Marfan syndrome and have been told that you have a short life and there's no hope for you, come and talk to me. It's a big lie. Anyway, it's a connective tissue disorder and the only thing it tends to make people tall and have if, does anybody want to be a coach? Basketball? If you want to be a basketball coach, you're going to have players who are very, very, very tall. You have to have them check for Marfan syndrome. It's a connective tissue disorder. So people tend to get tall because their growth plates tend to stretch. Their tissues are, you know, they tend to stretch out. They have long, very long arms and long legs, people with Marfan syndrome, out of proportion to their bodies. Okay, tend to be very thin. And the one thing that can the one thing that can be dangerous with Marfan syndrome, and often they have groups of the spine, but then, is that often the aorta will expand, and you'll get aortas bursting, people will die. So, uh, but there's an operation to fix it. Okay, they just have to monitor it. But there are some people who say people with Marfan syndrome. This is not how I have some personal involvement with people with Marfan syndrome. That's how I know ought to take beta blockers. They, since it's pressure on that aorta, they ought to slow down the beat, beta blockers will put less pressure on the aorta, okay? And they should avoid sports which cause bangs to the chest since the aorta might get right. Well, they've done research study after research study after research study, and even though it makes so much common sense that beta blockers will stop the expansion of that, that aorta, when they do controlled studies with people with Marfan syndrome, they don't make any difference. And there's never been a recorded case of a person with Marfan syndrome having any heart damage from a bang to the chest. So it makes common sense, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work. Okay, let's get back to, to correlation. You have to be very careful with correlations. 
okay? <coughs> Even if there is a correlation, you have to be careful about assuming the direction of the causality. Do clouds make rain or does rain make cause clouds? Okay, that you can laugh. <laughs> but does good self-esteem cause high achievement or does high achievement cause good self-esteem? There's a third underlying factor. This is not just a question up in the air. People did surveys. We have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on this. Come back to me now, on this self-esteem thing. And they noticed that kids who did well in school had a high self-esteem. Oh, high self-esteem kids in school? Here's what we have to do. We're going to build the kids' self-esteem, then they'll do better in school. So first of all, you're assuming a causal direction, right? Particularly kids who don't do well. So you have all these feel-good projects and this and that, right? And then, one of the things was done that was telling you, why do, for instance, they tried this with black inner city kids who were doing, weren't doing well. Let's do something to build their self-esteem. They think that black people can't achieve anything. So we'll build their self-esteem by showing them the great, blacks who have made great transitions to American culture. I can probably think of 50 without even going to a book, right? Go into a book and get thousands and thousands. Okay? Who's the person who made the greatest change, one of the great changes in American eating habits who happened to be black? Great biologist. Go ahead. Push it down. Uh, was it Washington? The peanut butter? <laughs> George Washington Carver, right. Peanut butter. The South was devastated from the boll weevil and cotton. So he decided, this guy was brilliant, he's the one with seedless grapes and all this stuff. So he decided to look for alternative uses for, we can grow peanuts, which tend to be resistant to diseases. Right, we'll make this, we'll push the Southern culture into, and, and most of the blacks in the South were in agriculture at the time, into peanuts. And I mean, they were starving, they didn't have any jobs because the cotton wasn't there. And he invented, among other things, peanut oils and peanut, peanut butter. What did kids take to school before peanut butter? Can you imagine an America without peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? <laughs> it, 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 how could it be? Once in a while, my mother would make a treat and give me a tuna sandwich, but I must have had 80% of my lunches when I was going for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. All right. Oh, I, know. I mean, you can, they're just all, I mean, it's just all over the place. I mean, how many, how, how smart do you have to be to come up with thousands, you know, thousands of black Americans? There? Matter of fact, I saw a book, was in a bookstore from before the great civil rights revolution, it was published in the 40s. And it was a thick book of Negro contributions to America, right? And I said, I'm going to buy this, but they wanted $125 for it. It was a rare volume. I said, I can't afford it, right? So, I mean, there were just tons of people in there, just tons of people. A lot of the stuff, settlement houses where Jane Addams, and I can't remember her name, and, and uh, the person who figured out blood typing. I mean, I don't know, just off the top of my head. I, you know, there's just, I mean, it's just, it, okay, so now I'm sitting there, and I'm a black kid, and I have this list of 500, you know, black people who have made great contributions to American culture in various aspects. But what does that have to do with the fact that I'm having trouble in fifth grade math? Or seventh grade math, I can't figure this stuff out. <coughs> Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's the kids who are achieving well who have good self-esteem. Or maybe, let's go back to the PowerPoint, maybe it's a third underlying factor. Maybe kids, and I'm, now I'm talking in general, who have certain kinds of family patterns tend to have good self-esteem and tend to be able to handle challenging tasks well, right? Maybe it's a third under effect that causes both. You don't know, okay? Come back to me, and maybe it's just random. Maybe it's just random. And you have to be careful. I'll tell you one more story. We don't have time for it. I want to do it anyway. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of Tay-Sachs disease? Okay. Tay-Sachs disease is a genetic disorder that tends to affect populations that inbreed. Okay. It's very common, for instance, among the Amish. And it's a very deadly disease. It, it, it's, it's a genetic fluke, which is extremely rare. Okay. It's, it's people who have the disease cannot metabolize certain fats, and the fats deposit 
on an infant's brain and the, the child dies by the time it's two and never really develops properly. It's very sad. I had friends that they say it's disease, right? And, but it's a recessive trait. So you have to have two people with a recessive gene to come together to have it. Well, the odds that two people in a general population are going to bump into each other, I think it's like two in a million, something like that. But it tends to pop up from time to time. But if you have populations that keep inbreeding, right, and they don't look outside of their own group, right, then you can hit it more and it becomes common. Okay, so Tay-Sachs disease is, is common in populations like that, the Amish, and, and it also was true of Eastern European Jews, okay? There are only a few million of them, and they, tend to, they married inside their own group, in particular since for most of their history, converting to Judaism was punishable by death so, in Europe. So if, you, if a Jew and a non-Jew marry, they tend to go off into the non-Jewish population, right? So, and they had taste sexes, and there are other genetic diseases that influence Eastern European Jews. Now, some people think that Eastern European Jewry started from a very small population and grew, and so that there was a lot of inbreeding. Okay? Clearly, all kinds of signs of inbreeding. In addition, in general, when you count the number of male babies and female babies, it's, there tend to be, it's around 50-50, there tend to be a few more females than males. Usually, in a given population, for every 95 males that are born, you get 100 females. Some people say, well, female infants tend to be a little hardier than male infants. So before you had modern medical techniques, so if you counted four months, it, some people say it may have been 50-50, and there were, it may be 50-50, but you had a slightly higher mortality rate among male infants than female infants. So it's around 50-50, or if anything, a few more females. Well, this population of Eastern European Jews had, a, had 125 males born for every 100 male, females way off the, right? And it was consistent wherever you looked. It was consistent, 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 consistent. And everybody chalked it up to genetics. There was a correlation between being an Eastern European Jew and having genetic diseases. So you assume that this was a genetic cause based on the previous correlation, right, correlation? Okay. And everybody believed it. You can even see that was just, just how it was. It was just something genetic. Then, there, then somebody, some wise guy came and said, I'm going to check this out. Let me do a new study. Came to America. So took Jews who had come to America, the, the vast majority of Jews who came to America between, from 1880s and 1920s and were Eastern Europeans, okay? And they did the same thing that most immigrant communities do. They come in to America, they Americanize, but the first generation, that, the, the, they tend to marry within their own culture, right? That's pretty typical, right? They live in ethnic communities, sometimes called ghettos, right? And the kids, the first kid, the kids who come here when they're very young, who are born here, they tend, they tend to marry within their own ethnic community, even though, and, but many of them tend to give up a lot of the aspects of the ethnic. They become Americanized. So this person went and looked at Eastern European Jews who were born and raised in America, right back to roughly the 50-50. It shocked scientists, okay? You'll never guess what happened. They did it a couple of times. Then somebody had the brains to go back in and go into a community of American Jews who had not acculturated, who remained, who maintained their, you know, their European identity, what they call Orthodox Jews. They were still at 125 and 100. Matter of fact, I was in the midst of doing a study with someone who one of my professors when she passed away, and that was the end of that. But we were in the midst of, of doing it again, right? It had to do with culture. Okay? It had nothing to do with genes. According to traditional Jewish culture, say so the only reason I, I, I know this, these things because I was doing a study, I bet that this I knew. According to traditional Jewish culture, you're not allowed to have sexual relations from the time menstruation starts until a week after it stops. In case you want to count, okay? And a, a masturbation was kind of frowned upon. So in case you want to count, you're allowed to have intercourse then just as a woman is ovulating, if there's a normal menstrual cycle, which most women have, right? And you have a high sperm count. That increases the odds of a male infant. I don't want to go into the whole why, but it does. So it had nothing to do with genes, it was culture. And the minute 
people came and we stopped following those traditions and just uh, Americanized. It stopped happening. So you have to be very, very careful about things coming together. Right? That's how, where a lot of ethnic stereotypes comes from. Right? There are people who will tell you today that <laughs> there's something about blacks that makes them genetically better at playing basketball. Yeah, really? Well, they were writing the same articles in the 1930s about Jews. Professional basketball, before the NBA, they used to have playoffs and tournaments, they were dominated by Jews. Professional basketball was dominated by Jews. The NBA was formed, right? Most of the players, when it was formed, many, many of them were Jews. It was just, I don't know, and there were, a lot of it has to do with, that's one sport, if you don't have a nice field in the suburbs, you can play that in the inner city, right? You can't play, pretty tough to play basketball, and I used to teach in inner schools. Those kids, football and baseball was a little tough for them, right? They didn't have any fields or anything. Basketball, you set up a court. Who knows what? So you have to be very careful. If you look over the course of the last few years, most, not all, but most of the great shortstops have been from the Dominican Republic. You think there's something in the genes of Dominicans that makes them better shortstops? You have to be very, very careful. You can tell I like baseball. Okay. You have to be very, very careful before you begin to make generalizations, just because things come together. And of course, we've heard the same stupid. That's the fire drill for those of you who are watching here. We'll wait for an announcement to see if it's... Attention. The building fire alarm has been activated. All occupants walk to the nearest available exit and evacuate the building. Wait one second. Wait one second and let's see if this is a test. Is it a test? No. I think the Attention. The building fire alarm has been activated. All right, looks like it was a false alarm, we'll see. Uh, in any case, in any case, you have to be very careful about assuming causality from correlation just because things come together doesn't mean that one causes the other. Okay, as I was saying, we have this thing about, oh, certain people with certain gen from certain racial groups, quote unquote, are more intelligent than others, we've had that stuff and it's, it's all mostly if you look at the evidence all mostly nonsense and if you find a correlation you've got to try to look for some underlying causal factor let me just say by the way that the very term race is a scientific embarrassment people are marrying each other all over the place but we'll get to that okay one other thing I want to talk about let's go back to the PowerPoint is logical fallacies in general okay good data are not enough okay you have to use proper logic when drawing conclusions about evidence that, we have, that you've gathered, okay? An error in logic, even when you have trustworthy data, can cause you to draw incorrect conclusions. And these things are called logical fallacies. Let me see if that goes somewhere. So here's some examples of logical fallacies. I already gave you a couple. So the circular definitions and the... And the um, Circle explanations and the causal correlation equals causality are both examples, but there are others that we use, and you have to be careful of them. When it rains, all the sidewalks get wet. Good data, right? 
Okay, come back to me for a second. I had a government grant. I wrote and I hired 75 people to observe all the sidewalks, uncovered sidewalks in Houston every time it rained. They always got wet. Government was impressed. So then I got a huge grant to examine all the uncovered sidewalks in Texas. Before you knew it, I had a hundred billion dollar grant and I examined every uncovered sidewalk all over the world and every single time it rained, the sidewalks got wet. Therefore, my conclusion is the sidewalks wet, it must have rained. Really? Come back here. What about the person washing your car? Okay. We did the same thing. People are damaged in certain areas of their brain, lose the ability to read. These data gathered and well-run experiments. Come back to me for a second, sorry. After World War II, it took a lot of soldiers who had what they then called closed head injuries. Soldiers who had brain damage from, you know, wounds in the war, lots of them. Okay, they had, I mean, unfortunately, they had more than you would ordinarily have under regular circumstances. And sure enough, they were pretty well, this was in the 40s, but at Clark University, this was done at Clark University, and sure enough, Certain damage to certain areas of the brain caused the person to lose the ability to read. It was pretty consistent. And they could predict if there's brain damage in this area, the person won't be able to read. Okay, therefore, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Therefore, if someone has trouble reading, learning how to read, that person's brain must be damaged. Can you think of possible alternatives? Obviously, that could be, but there are plenty of other reasons. Bad logic. Good data. Good data gathered in well-run experiments. Or bad conclusion. And you come up with junk. Here's another one. The new program isn't perfect, therefore we should use the old program. We hear that all the time. Teachers are resisting. And you'll be one of them. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> resisting programs will say, ah, this is wrong with it, and that's wrong with it, and this is wrong with it, and that's wrong with it. Yeah, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, but what about the old program? Does this have defects. So you have to be careful about your logic. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You have to be careful when people are saying things to you. How do you know? How do you know? And does the, do the conclusions that you drew make sense? Okay? We already did this. What did that say, that it was a false alarm? Safe. Oh, safe to enter the building. Okay. Now we have to talk about something else. We have to talk about why scientists gather data. Okay? If I said to you, <clears throat> tell me your name. Rosanna. Push it down. Rosanna. Yeah, Rosanna. Rose, keep that bottle of water. See that bottle of water? Hold it up, Rosanna, see it? There's Rosanna's bottle of water, thank you. Now, she always brings a bottle of water, because let's say she always brings one, and I spent the whole semester measuring how far, get back on Rosanna, the picture back on Rosanna. See where she has the, who's in her way? Who's in the way? There you go, thank you. See she has the bottle of water on the edge of the desk? I spend the whole semester, come back to me now, measuring how far from the front of the desk Rosanna leaves the water? And at the end of the semester, I come to say that on the average, she leaves, and oh boy, I'm doing it with, la with laser-guided measuring instruments. She leaves at 3.72986 inches with the range of from, from 2.999786 to 4.1101379, <coughs> right? Boy, those are accurate data. What's your reaction to this experiment? My reaction is, who cares? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so what? <laughs> All the stupid things to spend your time on, right? What do you care? All right? So. The question is, why are you gathering the data that you're gathering? Okay. Why are you doing that? Right? What are you up to? What's science about anyway? Okay? 
Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And science is about data and theories. By the way, one more thing, okay? Come back to me. The word data is plural. Anybody take Latin in high school? Another person. You took Latin in high school? No kidding. Did you go to a Catholic high school or a public high school? Push it down. Public. What, here in Texas? Yeah. So they still teach Latin in public high schools. Bless you. It's wonderful. So, do you remember any of it? Me neither. <laughs> okay. So, okay. There are masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns in Latin. Data is a plural of datum. It's a neuter plural, datum, datum, like curriculum, curricula, right? Data are, the data are convincing, not the data is convincing, are. I'm not a fanatic about this. The word graffiti is plural. Graffitis, graffiti, that's masculine, singular, and plural. You remember any of this? Nah, <laughs> who remembers Latin anyway? <laughs> graffitis, graffiti. But I'm not fanatic because we never use the word graffitis. So I'm going to say the graffiti is on the wall. But you use the word datum. I have a one datum here. Data R. That probably will be on the test. Okay, so we have data. Let's go back to PowerPoint. Data and theories. Findings and theories, okay? All right, somebody tell me the difference. Come back to me. Sorry, somebody tell me the difference. What's the difference between data or findings or objects? How do we get data? Yeah. What? Yeah. Push, it, push it down, push it down. You gather it. You gather the data, right. So what's data? The stuff that we, fill that sentence in. Data are the findings that we, how do we gather it? By thinking about it? <coughs> how? Research. What? Research. Push it down, push it down. Research. Research, that's right. So you gotta do research. You can't just think about it. And in our research, we observe things. We look. Okay, and what's theory? Let's, what? Data are things we observe, right? Okay, we're gonna take a vote now. Remember, you have to vote. Here's the vote. Gravity. Gravity is a fact, data, or gravity is a theory. Who votes? Those of you watching on television, those of you watching on tapes, vote. Vote. I can't tr test you, but uh, you, you're going to have to live with your conscience if you don't vote. Okay. Who votes that gravity is a fact? Who votes that gravity is a fact? Mm, most people. Who votes that gravity is a theory? Well, we got about two thirds, one third. Okay, who voted that it was a fact? Okay, if gravity's a fact, tell me your name? Tisha. Tisha, come over here. <laughs> bring the pen, okay, never bring, bring the pen with you just in case you need it. Okay, ready? Tisha, if gravity's a fact, I ought to be able to observe it. Okay, show me gravity. That's what everybody does, drops a pen, that's why I told her to bring it. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, where are you going? Okay. What I saw was you had a pen in your hand, you dropped it, and it fell to the floor. I didn't see gravity. Your turn to talk. <laughs> okay. <I don't laughs> we saw the effect of gravity. I saw the effect of gravity. But I didn't see the gravity. So what's gravity? I guess it's a theory. <laughs> it's a theory. I don't know. <laughs> Wait a minute. Not so fast. Do it again. Do it. Ready? Do it again. Okay. Here's what happens. There are unseen ghosts. <laughs> That, that are around, okay? Hold it out. They're not very strong, and the ghosts like to push everything into the ground, but they're not as strong as people. So as long as she's holding it, the ghost's trying to push it down but can't. The minute she lets it go, the ghost pushes it down and it goes onto the floor. Can't see grab, can't see the ghosts. I didn't mean to pick on Tisha. Does anybody, okay, thank you very much. Give her a big hand. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. By the way, by the way, what Tisha has done is what physicists do. Gravity is a theory, but what, if a theory is powerful, they treat it like a fact. 
Okay, here I'll show you gravity. If you're, I, I believe that this is the theory for gravity. Don't hold me to it. Let's here. I'm going to the um, whatever this thing is called. Oh. The gravitational force equals the mass of one object times the mass of the other over the distance squared between them times towards some kind of constant. I believe that's the right theory, something like that. Okay. So come back to me. Oh, okay, never mind, never mind, say this. So in other words, the greater the mass of the two objects. Okay, Tisha, what were the two objects that you had? Okay. Oh, push it down. Push it down. Push the top down. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> a pen. I have the pen in my hand. And what, what was the, gra the gravitational attraction was to? Well, um, the floor. But it was more than the floor. That's true, by the way. There is a gravitational attraction between the earth and the floor. But what was the, what was it, what made it fall so fast? What's it being, what's it, does anybody know? Air. What? Push it down, <laughs> say it. Air. Yeah, say it. Air. Not, no, not the air, because it went through the air. What's it, what's, yeah. The resistance, the air resistance? No, that will stop the gravity. That'll stop it. But what made it fall? What's it being attracted? It's being attracted to the Earth, right? It's being attracted to the Earth. The air resistance will cause less, cause it to fall less fast. We'll fall a little faster if we were in a vacuum. Of course, she and I both would have been dead, but that's a different story. Okay? So the greater the mass of the two objects, the greater the, the gravitational attraction. The farther the distance, the less, right? The bigger the denominator, the less, right? <coughs> If you have 100 over 2, 10 over 2, it's more than 10 over 5, right? Times some constant. So, for instance, the Earth has a gravitational attraction to the sun, two things with two huge mass, but they're far apart, so the Earth doesn't fall into the sun. Good thing for us. But the attraction, gravitational attraction makes it go around, okay? That's a theory. Okay, come, come back to me now. It's an exponent. So, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Data are the evidence, data are, are, see, evidence, observations, facts gathered by science. And theory is an explanation of the facts. It attempts to explain why the world is the way it is. And, as you'll notice with, tell me your name again? T Tisha. Tisha, okay. When we get, when we get come, get, come back to me for a second. When we get powerful theories, we often treat them like facts, but they're theories. So for instance, an atom is a theory. <coughs> Nobody's ever seen an atom. I had a big fight with a physicist I used to work with. He said to me, okay, he said, I, okay, an atom is only a theory, but it's such a powerful one, we'll never get rid of it. But my, my explanation of the ghosts is also a theory. It's also a theory. Okay? By the way, it stinks. <laughs> okay, it's a terrible theory. In general, by the way, scientists, there's no way to prove that that's true. If I were to say to scientists, I actually have seen these ghosts, okay, I've seen the ghosts, but you can't see them because you don't believe in them. Let's just stay here until Phil makes a call. So, attention. Attention. <laughs> every semester I re every semester I record something like this happens, so it doesn't bother me. Right? All right, we only have a couple of minutes to go. One. Okay, now, so as I say, if you were to say, to, if, a, if I said to the scientists, the only people who can see the ghosts are people who believe in them, and since you don't believe in them, they won't show themselves to you, the scientists would have to say to me, I'm never going to find them. Because my mindset is to doubt. You have to bring me evidence that they exist. And besides, I have a lot better explanation than yours. But so it's, that's, 
Science, theoretically, if something, if, if that, such a ghost existed, science could never find it, okay? So what we get here, let's go back to the PowerPoint. <coughs> so ultimately what we get here is that we have a theory that's an explanation for what we see. And theory should explain the data that we have. And that means now it's okay. Okay? Your attention, please. Your attention, please. All right. Let's do this one first. Theories explain data. I can't remember what day of the week it is after this. Okay, wait. Theories explain data. Look, here's what happens. Theories attempt to present a coherent model of the universe, a picture of what the universe is like. Okay? So in other words, in other words, come back to me for a second. I see pens falling. I see stars, moving stars, which I call plants moving through the sky. I see water flowing downhill. I see all these things. And I'm trying to get a model, something to explain all these things. So let's go back to this pad. Okay, Newton cooked up this model, and he said, Newton cooked up this model, he said, if you assume that this is how the world is working, this will explain all the movements. That's a pretty good model. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? If I see, okay, we do that all the time. Okay, we're always making models. Here, come, come back to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk. Okay, I've been following. Tell me your name. Oh. Vera. Vera? Yeah. Okay, I've been following. Can you, can you see Vera on the television? I've been following Vera around for a few months. Okay, let me get back here so you can see. Okay, Vera, come up here. Okay, come up here. Don't worry about it. Nobody watches the show anyway. Okay? <laughs> I've been following Vera around for several months. It's easy. All she does is stay in bed all day. <laughs> Under the covers, sighs, doesn't talk. I say, Vera, I got any plans for the future? No, life is miserable and hopeless. Vera, what are you going to do today? I'm going to sit here and be miserable. <laughs> She cries, she ducks under the blanket, right? Vera, tell me about life. Life is miserable and horrible. I hate everything. You would say Vera is, don't say an undergraduate student at U of H. Vera is, push it down. Push it down, somebody say, okay, Vera, here. She probably knows about anybody else. Depressed. Vera's depressed. That's a theory. I can't see depressed. I can't touch depressed. I say, I, I make a whole bunch of observations about Vera, right? I make a whole bunch of observations about her, and I said, I can explain all this with one thing and depressed. Now, if I catch her ducking under the blanket and find that she has a flashlight under there, and she's writing a, a, a novel, and she's putting this thing on as an act just to get rid of people, then I have to change. I have a different set of data. What's she doing under there writing? I thought she thought life was hopeless. She has no plans for the future, right? I have to change my theory. I have a new piece of data. Then I have to find out why she's doing the other stuff in writing under there. You understand? I could ask her. If she says to me, you know something, all these questions you're asking me are bothering me. Will you please leave me alone? I have stuff to do. I could say, ah, I have a new theory, right? She's a recluse. She wants people to leave alone so she can get her stuff. They give me her a big hand. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Okay. So a theory is a model that tries to, let's go back to the PowerPoint. It tries to explain things we see. Gravity's a model. The solar system's a model. No one's ever, the solar system is a theory. Oh my God. Come back to me. The solar system's a theory. No one's ever seen the solar system. Matter of fact, next week, next class, I'm going to prove to you that the Earth can't be moving. I'm going to prove it to you. Okay? 
No one's ever seen it. Who's ever seen it? You have to stand outside of it and see it. Oh, they're shooting off a rocket. Ooh, it's going to get to Jupiter. Ooh, it's going to get to... It's still inside the whole thing. No one's ever stood outside and observed it. It's a theory. Shocked? It's a good one. But I'm going to prove to you it's wrong. I'm going to prove to you the Earth can't be moving. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So psychological theories present models of thinking, behavior, and emotions. That's what they're about. Okay, that's what they're about. Let me go back, come back to me now. So, the, so what we have now, what we have then is, let's go back here, okay. Since a theory is a model of part of the world and data can provide support for a theory by confirming the theory's predictions, okay, or data can require us to modify or discard the model because the data don't confirm the theory's predictions, right? As happened once I looked under and see Vera's under there writing a book, okay? In other words, if the evidence doesn't support what you believe, you ought to change your mind. Even though I am absolutely convinced that Vera shows every symptom of a, depressed, of a depression, if I have data that she's writing books, I have to change my mind about what's, what's going on here. Of course, there's still something wrong with somebody who spends every, every, every day in bed, but I've got to change my mind about what's wrong. Maybe she's got some obsessive compulsive kind of thing, or maybe I don't know. Okay, so next, week we'll, next time we'll finish this, hopefully without too many alarms, and we'll go from there.